And welcome to Demiplane and to the Claw Firm, Feather, Whisker, and Horn. I'm Mark Mir, your Game Master, and these are your player characters. Let's meet them now and hear a little bit about who they're playing. Let's start with the order on my screen, starting with Xander. Yes, hello, I'm Xander Genre. You can find me all over at Xanderific with two R's and one F. And today I'm playing Cornette, the Silent Priest a Tengu cleric uh, who presents uh, like a male Blue Jay person. <laughs> uh, next up, Blue Jay. Hi, I'm Blue Jay. My pronouns are she, her, and you can find me all over the internet. Um, mostly all my links are going to be on Twitter um, at Blue Jay underscore 712. Um, and today I am playing Violette, the garish thief, um, which is uh, Coronet's twin egg. Mm -hmm hatchling right person um i'm just very excited um and i am a, a female blue jay type uh character a, a tenku swashbuckler and much more brilliantly colored accessories than my twin <laughs> uh, next up jody Hi, I'm Jody Hauser. You can find me on the internet with various screen names, but primarily at Twitter with Jody underscore Hauser. And today I am playing Hortense Pricklepaw, who is a catfolk magus, uh, sort of Russian blue looking and probably buried in a book when you see her. Thank you. And Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Fermina. You can find me all across all social media at A Style Pixie. Today I am playing Calla Lily, also known as Lily. Um, she is a tiefling summoner, who's basically like a very sheltered Disney princess, but with horns. And Aliza. Love that description. Uh, hi, I'm Elisa Pearl. You can find me at Elisa Pearl on Twitter and Instagram, and the real Elisa Pearl on TikTok. And today I'm playing Pegasi, who is a Konrasu alchemist with an emissary background and is a tree, well, presents as a tree person, we'll put it that way. Hmm. Very well. And so let us set the stage. We begin our story in Absalom the city at the center of the world, filled with teeming populace of all species, many peoples coming together in this one location. And of course, like any great city, it has its bureaucracies, it has its rules, it has its laws. And those that interpret them are known as lawyers. Some would say that they are the lowest and some the highest. <laughs> but the lawyers hold their own counsel. We begin at the estate of one prominent lawyer, a Ms. Feather, of the law firm Feather, Whisker, and Horn. In a particular room, a rather spacious room, shared by two individuals, waking now as the morning sun creeps in through the window on a moon day in Saradin, hmm. our equivalent of June. <laughs> who among these two individuals, and I think you know who you are, who among these two individuals is likely to be stirring first? Cornette is already up, <laughs> but 
uh, true to his name, is very quiet uh, and is silently going through a meditation ritual, um, waking in the morning, preening his feathers, making sure that his robes are pressed, that when the sun comes through, it is in the most um, pristine position, that uh, it ties all of the room together, and so that when his lovely sister finally opens her eyes from her sprawled out position, that she'll see the most beautifully clean room that has ever existed. Lovely. Uh, could you describe for our viewers slash listeners, uh, could you physically describe Cornette? Yes, Cornette uh, has uh, very cleanly pressed robes that seem to be made of sort of uh, blue and white fabric. Uh, it is sort of rough around the edges, but worn as if uh, it's a sa daily vestment that uh, has been sort of maybe prescribed, but cared for. Uh, and this is over some sh um, brightly uh, colored blue feathers and a white feathered face that is outlined in black. Uh, and there's sort of like a deep black outline of the eyes that would be so beautiful, if not sternly pressed into a focused th thinking position. <laughs> Very well. Let's hear about the other occupant of this room. <laughs> so, the morning rays, of course, are making it impossible to sleep in as you might wish to. So Violet probably was out a lot later than Cornet. <laughs> um, snuck in through the window, yeah. you know, bird. Um, <laughs> and is just now waking up because all attempts at staying in bed longer have failed her. Um, you you might not think that a bird could have bed head, but she's <laughs> succeeding. Um, so she also has these bright blue feathers. Um, the, the face patterning is very similar to Coronet, but you can see the ways in which she's kind of like made her appearance her own. She has um, like a lot of like beads and... Um, like necklaces and, and necklace pieces, very shiny objects, very magpie. Um, she's wearing a brightly colored, probably like orange, pink, something that clashes with the blue of her feathers. Um, just like a, a tunic, a scarf, just layers of color and fabric and texture. And when she rolls out of bed, she <laughs> literally rolls out of bed. And at first it was a, oh no, I'm awake, but she smoothly turns it into like an acrobatic roll and gets up on her feet. Um, very, uh, like it started as an accident. It ended with panache. Um, and uh, she shakes, uh, like settles her feathers um, and looks to where Coronet has cleaned up what she definitely did not leave clean <laughs> <laughs> when she got in in the middle of the night and says, Ah, good morning. Well, this place is fresh as always. Uh, just to clarify, so you, you're wearing these necklaces and what sounds like outdoor clothing. Are you wearing what you went came oh, yes. home in last night? Oh, yes. Okay, so, yeah, so no, no need to get dressed. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a lot faster if you never change into pajamas. The only time at which Violette probably changes her clothes is when someone points out that they're very dirty or smelly. <laughs> um so it's uh, fine now, everything's fine you blend in you know now uh did you sleep in your well actually that's a question do you wear footwear uh of mm. any court sort uh i'm envisioning that she has uh like bird claws bird talon feet. Feet. it helps talon feet it helps to cling to rooftops it helps to yeah so i am assuming no on the footwear so no uh, little like you know uh, spats or gators that let oh your oh my claws gosh that would it. be fun <laughs> I mean it goes with the swashbuckler look <laughs> I mean yes okay we have the claws but we have like spats at on atop the claws we have the all of the um, the buttons to attach them are different buttons they used to be the same but you know you have to repair them so like the, they're now a series of different types of metals from different things like one's obviously not meant for like, it's like a tiny little, like, I don't know, abalone or mother of pearl one. Yeah, no, they're great. Uh, so, yes, you you have uh, expressed uh, what you have said as you roll out of bed. Is there any reply from Cornette? 
Yeah, well, as loud as Violette is on this uh, tumble out of bed and all of the clinking beads and little things, and then finally she's saying out loud to Cornet, you can almost hear the silence as it settles in the room as he does a familiar greeting response for the morning. Mm. <sighs> you know, it is really nice to wake up to a clean room, the light shining through the window, I can smell... Did you make tea? With this, he'll sort of like bring some tea cups out. <laughs> <laughs> He's just been silently shuffling about as she's going off. <laughs> ah, this is the life. You know, Cornet, what would I do without you? Surely die. <laughs> he, he gestures. <laughs> gestures indicating surely die. Yes. yes. We have, I understand Cornet's uh, physical language. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would think so. Uh, the two of you, of course, are exceedingly close, being siblings, and this is the room that you have shared uh, together for uh, your childhood. It's at this point that at the wooden door of the room, there is a sharp rap, uh, as if a long talon was being wrapped against the door. And you both know that's exactly what's happening. Children, children. At this, uh, Coronet speeds over to Violet's bed and quickly makes it. <laughs> <laughs> it's this, like Violet does not even notice that that's <laughs> happening. It has become so rote. So Violet just like here's the here's the rap, here's the children. I roll long groan, and then she just like you know walks over to the door, and then peels it open with just the most teenagery, like long suffering groan. Yes. <laughs> and of course the figure that is revealed by this opening door is very familiar to both of you. A rather matronly uh, silhouette uh, topped with the head of an owl, mm. wide eyes peering at you, a small pair of spectacles perched on the end of the short curved beak. Uh, you see one of the talons uh, that was used to rap upon the door, and you see the gaze of these large eyes falls on you, Violette. Oh, Violette, you're already up and dressed, I must say, most industrious of you, uncharacteristically so. Violette preens a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I gotta be on your toes. Yes, of course. And, um, hmm, isn't that what you were wearing yesterday? I'm just saving Coronet the laundry duty, is all. Cut to Coronet, who's disheveled and making the bed and trying to clean <laughs> everything, <laughs> like, out of breath. <laughs> ah, Coronet, so uh, good to see you as well. He sort of collects himself. A greeting. Hmm. Uh, she returns the gesture, almost exactly, and strides into the room, looking about. Well, hmm, today is the day, I suppose. Yes, yes, uh, I did call you children, but I suppose that neither of you is in really a child any longer, are you? I'd say we've been quite uh, independent for some time. Mm, yes, I am aware of your opinions on this matter, <laughs> Violet. Mm. She says but... having done nothing for herself all morning. <laughs> yeah. Tea sip. <laughs> However, with mm, approaching adulthood comes not only new privileges, but new responsibilities. And as such, it would behoove you to keep that in mind. Hmm. However, I do not think it quite appropriate that the two of you should share a chamber any longer. You each need your own space, I think. And so, one of you will have to move. Who shall it be? <laughs> Instant <laughs> wing raise <laughs> from Cornet. Ah, yes. Um, you're not sure you'd prefer to relocate, Violette? Um, Find a, a nice clean room that you can get messy again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
I'm just uh, back up for just a moment. Um, must we? I think things are great the way they are. Honestly, like this room is spacious. It's it's good. It's clean. It's got good light for Cornette's morning meditations. Like Cornette, if you move to a different room, it might not have as good light for mm -hmm. the mornings. You can uh, see a repeat in the gesture of if I stay here, I will surely die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss Feather sort of acknowledges you with a nod, Cornet, and then turns to Violette and says, you must understand, my child, that one cannot stagnate. Entropy. No, 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 no. One must always move forward. Momentum, you understand. Uh, one must put away childish things eventually. I mean, I understand momentum, but I quite like trophies. Um, so I don't know why we have to not have those. Oh, no, entropy. Mm. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> I seem to get the feeling that uh, Cornet might approve of a new uh, how, how do you young people put it uh, digs yeah <laughs> are they still are they still saying that mm -hmm. do they still say digs for where yes. to stay yes very well so we will accommodate you and well Violet, if you're a little less anxious to move on then i suppose you can stay here in this room which has served you so well as a child i mean is uh, like is like, I, I mean, is the other room better? I haven't even seen it. What's in it? Uh, I is it on the first floor? Is it on the second floor? <laughs> uh, it's just down the hall. It was one of the guest rooms. Uh, it is a in dimension similar to this. I want it to be equitable, after all. Uh, and she looks over to Coronet and mm. is just like kind of like trying to feel like Coronet. Please. Please let me have this. <laughs> I mean, like, all of my stuff is here. So, like, I guess I could stay here. Sure. A this gesture? Totally my decision and has nothing to do with my affection for my twin at all. Then it is decided. <laughs> hmm. Very well, then. Uh, come, gather your things, Cornet. <laughs> There's, like, a single pack that he picks up that has already been packed up. <laughs> As soon as you, like, to go to move your stuff, Violette starts pushing the two beds together so she can have one big <laughs> bed. Uh, we were planning on... Uh, oh. Never mind. <laughs> Very well. Uh, yes, and uh, you will be pleased to hear, Cornet, that uh, the, the light in the new room is even better, uh, all the better for you to contemplate the glories of the Dawnflower. My gratitude is eternal. He gestures. Ah, oh, such a life, a life, fellow, I must say. <laughs> I have raised you well, and then turns to Violette. I have also raised you. <laughs> <laughs> Violette raised is you like, in, like immediately not paying any attention. She moved, <laughs> she had moved Cornette's bed and then found like a couple of things that had been like away from him being able to clean up and she was like <laughs> up feeds and like oh i lost this like two years ago. Hmm, um do, does she does she actually vocalize that oh yeah <laughs> yeah um you know a, a, a modicum of organization of your possessions violet uh, might prove efficacious to your locating them in a timely manner yeah but then i wouldn't get like a cool present for myself right Hmm. I suppose that's one way of looking at things. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, Cornet, if you are quite prepared, let's get you settled, and then the two of you shall be accompanying me to the firm. Oh, there is a change in Cornet's demeanor of, like, now he is an adult. <laughs> Oh, yes, very impressive. Yes, yes, yes. As mentioned, uh, with new privileges come new responsibilities. And the other senior partners and I have decided that perhaps our wards are ready for such responsibilities. There's a desperate yes gesture. Yes, please. Mm, There's several yes. objects being tossed in the corner. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, uh, Philip, uh, did you did you hear me? We're we're going to the firm. Um, perhaps uh, yesterday's garb might not be quite appropriate. Hmm? Uh, something a little more, um, shall we say, businesslike. Violet like shakes out something of coronets that she found underneath the bed and is like, "How about this?" <laughs> I suppose that will do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um yeah, she'll 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 do a like a coronet cosplay for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very well. Um, uh yes, coronet. Uh, uh she brings you down the hall to a new room. And yes, it is of very similar dimensions. Hmm. But the window does, you think, uh it's a little later in the day, but you think that the first rays of the sun will hit this room and seems very suited to your purpose. As a worshiper of Sir Henry. Yeah, Coronet will survey this room and touch every surface with gratitude. Just so thankful that he was has this opportunity and is willing to show what he has learned. Uh, question, Violette, did you busy yourself in your room? Did you uh, follow down to see the new room? or? Um, I think that she's... Uh, she's doing the stubborn thing where if she doesn't get it, she doesn't even want to acknowledge that. It's <laughs> <Yeah. right. laughs> um, so she's kind of feeling like a little like obviously Miss Feather is pointing out all of her deficiencies. So she's distracting herself with shiny objects. Um, and yeah, when she finally, when they do get like called together, she has kind of like attempted to make herself look um presentable but you can see like underneath one of the like robes is like a orange something or other and like she forgot one earring is still like i mean not earring i guess but like one like set of beading is still like hanging off some feathers and like yeah so she's tried but like there is marked differences between herself and coronet yeah uh still miss feather does seem to uh, acknowledge that you've gone to a lot more effort than you might do otherwise, and just oh, oh yes, very nice, very, very nice indeed. And um, if we are ready, mm. our carriage awaits. And with that, we move to another estate, similarly luxurious, elsewhere in Absalom, where we pick up in the bedchamber of one Hortense Cricklepaw. Now we're going back in time a little bit, so this is in a similar time frame to the first scene that we saw. So as the morning rays of the sun creep into this room, first of all, could you describe the room that we see? Uh, it looks more like a library than a bedroom. There are just bookcases everywhere and the books don't seem to necessarily be in an order that makes sense to an outside observer, but is one of those things where if you ask Hortense where a specific volume is, she knows exactly. It's like her own weird cataloging system. And there's a writing desk with stacks of papers, stacks of like little leather bound uh, journal type blank books, a uh, pen. It's, it's sort of organized chaos is probably a good way to describe it. And within this organized chaos, where do we find Hortense Cricklepaw? Uh, she is still asleep because she was up late reading. But now she is very cozy in her bed and probably dreaming of a story that she read recently or something along those lines. But, you know, kitty, sleepy, sleepy kitty. Uh, our sleepy kitty is awakened by a knock at the door. She just scrambles out of bed and throws a robe on and uh, slicks the fur to make it a le little less rumpled and goes and opens the door. Uh, you, you mentioned fixing the fur. Could you describe Hortense physically? Ah, uh, yes. She has sort of a grayish uh, fur, sort of what you would think of like a Russian blue, uh, big green eyes, and she's she still has a little bit of like the kitteny type face, so her features are still kind of round, but they're starting to get that like the sharpness of like an adult cat, but she's not quite there yet. And as you open the door, speaking of adult cats, 
a rather feline and familiar face stares back at you. Orange, green eyes, and a haze of pipe smoke. As Mr. Whisker intones, Paging Miss Prickleball. Hello, right, right here. Hmm. I can't help but notice that you have overslept. Were you reading into the night again? It was just so interesting, and I didn't want to put it down, and I was, you know, taking notes um, so I'd remember it better later, and I just... I had lost track of time. Hmm. Such is your way. As Mr. Whisker chuckles and strides past you into the room, he uh, is putting his pipe away. Uh, question, has, how does uh, Hortense feel about his pipe smoking? It's, it's his thing, and he's her mentor, and she's not going to criticize, but she does appreciate when he doesn't smoke too close to the books because they hold on to the scent, and it isn't good for them long term. It'll yellow the paper. And in fact, that is exactly why he is putting his pipe away, and he sort of makes a show of it and points to it in his pouch. Now then, what exactly were you reading about last night? What could have kept you from slumber so long? Oh, it was a history of an assassination, but they weren't really sure all the details, so there was a lot of speculation and picking up historical clues from different documents and some very suspicious letters that were entirely signed, but there was some comparison of handwriting and maybe a hint of an initial somewhere, so it was all very interesting, and I don't think they really came to a solid conclusion, but, you know, it's just fascinating to sort of look back at political uprisings in the past and see what forces might have gotten us there and, like, who really takes the blame in the long term and, you know. Hmm. An eye for detail. One of your admirable qualities. Hortense. Yes. You've been with me a while now, haven't you? I mean, pretty much as long as I can remember, yes. Hmm. And tell me, in that time, would you say I have been a just guardian? I mean, yes, you you let me collect all these books. You made sure I had all the, you know, training and education and everything I needed. I mean, I think that's that's very fulfilling of your duties as a guardian person. Hmm. And if I may, you have proven the most apt pupil. But the time comes for every pupil to graduate. Um, to, to, to what? You are almost of age, Hortense. And now, now I think it is time for you to join, let us call it, the family business. The, the firm? Hmm. <laughs> Not as a partner, I assure you. Oh, well, no, I have may... so much more reading to do first. Mm, there may be time for that. But you do know that we have mm, certain errands and tasks we need fulfilled. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mm. And, uh, oh, do I have to do those now? Yes. Yes, I think it is time. You probably would feel more comfortable staying within a library for the rest of your existence. Yeah, that's 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 kind of what I was, you know, thinking of doing. Mm. Well, I think it best that a field trip be arranged. Perhaps you can supplement your scholastic endeavors. Sure, that that sounds that sounds great. Mm. Yeah. You do not seem Overly enthused. Oh, I'm just, um, I'm just thinking of what reading materials would be most useful for me to bring along on this new, uh, job. To, mm. you know, 
to do. I want to do well. Perhaps something short for the ride to the firm. A carriage is prepared. You, of course, have not breakfasted yet. And he reaches beneath his robes and pulls forth a small silver tray. On it is Hortense's favorite breakfast. What might that be? A uh, salmon. Just mm -hmm. like a nice smoked salmon. Maybe maybe on a bagel. Yep, some nice, some very nice lox. Little, little uh, square of cream cheese on the side. A uh, little bit of parsley uh, for garnish. For you. That's milk. And, and of course, there is some milk. He reaches into another pouch and pulls out a small bottle of milk. Very well. Breakfast, dress yourself, and prepare. Okay. I'm sure everything will be great. <laughs> that is the spirit. And he chuckles to himself, and as he walks out, immediately as soon as he's out of your room, the pipe is lit again. As we move on from this second palatial estate to a third. This one, however, is much more utilitarian. It seems that nothing has been spent uh, in terms of decoration, only functionality. The same might not be said for the room that we find ourselves moving into. In a tall tower. Could you tell us, what does Calla Lily's room look like, Eric? Uh, there's definitely a stark contrast from the rest of the house to Calla Lily's room. You go in there and she has adorned it with fresh flowers, ribbons, just every corner there's something hanging there's plants and just colors it's very it's very fun and um frivolous <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's certainly in sharp contrast and contrast to the rest of the estate and where do we find Callily? has Callily gone risen before the dawn is Callily just waking up deep in slumber Callily rises with the sun so the sun's out, she's just happy to greet the day. She gets up, she brushes her long purple hair and is braiding it and also adorning it with ribbons and flowers and things like that. She uh, puts on a nice fresh frock and is just getting ready. <laughs> uh, you mentioned long purple hair. Could you describe the rest of Calla Lily physically? Yes. Um, Right now she's sitting, so you can't see how tall she is, but when she does stand up, she is about six feet tall. Um, a little taller, including the horns, I would say. Um, so with the horns, she might be closer to 6'5". Um, they do curve, so it's sort of like an upward. And her skin is pink. It's very... Um, sort of muted dusty pink but she has these really reflective purple eyes deep purple hair and her horns sort of go into a black tip and as Kelly prepares herself there is the sound of what you're quite sure is a walking stick rapping against your door <laughs> She Hello, up. Lily! Oh, oh, yes! And she runs over to the door and swings it open. Uh, you see, again, a familiar face. The pale white skin and yellow eyes, the pointed goat-like horns, and long chin beard of Mr. Horn, your guardian. Hello, Lily, girl! Three knocks is too many. One should answer after one. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. I just was, um, I was just getting ready for the day. Indeed. And a momentous day it is as well, my child. Sorry, one more time. I, um, <laughs> my mind, uh, just... Hmm, wandered, as it often does. Yes. A momentous day is what I said. Mm-hmm. 
That's why I put the um, extra ribbons in my hair. Extra ribbon? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a momentous day is not necessarily the cause to be frivolous, even more frivolous than usual. Extra ribbons, indeed. Uh, yes, Mr. Horn. Uh, forgive my demeanor. I am. Um, I can deny you nothing. Extra ribbons it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, do you not wish to know why it is a momentous day, Kelly Lily? Or are you merely content to adorn yourself with ribbons? I would love I would love to know. Mm. This day, Kelly Lily, is momentous because you are about to undertake responsibility. Oh. What um hmm. what what type of responsibility? Uh, certainly more than the simple uh, chores and tasks that I have set for you here. Mm -hmm. No. As you know, the senior partners and I each have in our care a number of young wards, such as yourself. You are familiar with them. Uh-huh. But you shall become more than familiar. You shall become, shall we say, a unit, a team. A team? Indeed. For the tasks we require you to complete cannot be completed by a single individual. Well, I suppose by one extremely accomplished one, but um, nevertheless, you are going to work for the firm. What, it, it, uh, what, so I get to work with, with everyone else at the firm? Uh, not at the firm, precisely. Oh. For the firm. Though, um, how are your filing skills? Um, I, I feel like I could be very organized. Mm, I have all yes. of my, um, ribbons and flowers sorted by color and length. Well, that's something, I suppose. In any case, uh, you are prepared. Have you breakfasted as yet? Um, not quite yet. Hmm. Well, I've had the cook whip something up for you. Uh, he snaps his fingers, and a servant, who you realize must have been lingering in the hall, brings in a tray. What is on that tray? Um, on that tray, I would say, is a little platter of pancakes with uh, berries and whipped cream on them. Mm. A rather mm, extravagant meal for, for breakfast, I find. But nevertheless, I am aware you are quite partial to this meal. It is my favorite. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I shall leave you to it, and um, if any further ribbons need to be applied, I shall be awaiting you in the downstairs hall. A carriage will take us to the firm. Okay, great. Um, I will be down uh, shortly. Very good. It's at this point that we see shots images of the various carriages with their occupants making their way through the streets of Absalom, the city at the center of the world. A cacophony of people of all types milling about various conveyances, taking people to and fro on a busy morning. And because they didn't get to have breakfast, let's actually go into the carriage of Violette and Cornette, where Miss Feather has actually taken the opportunity to prepare them their favorite meals to go. What are they breakfasting upon in the carriage? Uh, I will say that Cornette has in front of him a bag of seeds, and an empty bag, and you can see him carefully selecting one bit by bit, peeling them, throwing the shells into the other bag and nibbling on the seed. <laughs> and it's very mindful. Uh, each seed contains multitudes. <laughs> hmm. uh, Miss Feather is actually across from you doing the same sort of ritual mm. uh, with her breakfast, except uh, it's um, uh, uh, mice. Uh, oh! <laughs> you she's can an, see she's an owl. She's yeah. an owl. <laughs> There is sort of a reaction from the vegetarian of like, oh, wow. <laughs> and what about Violette? 
Um, Violette found in her room an old bag of peanuts, um, and she rejected the generous offer from Mrs. Feather and Miss Feather, and instead is like, it's this striped like circus bag of peanuts, and she's doing the thing where like birds will like uh, nibble on it and then like spit the peanut shells like everywhere. <laughs> Just so really like careful. her whole front like that was semi clean is now covered in the pe the the peanut shells and like she's just like doing the nibbling thing and then like spitting some of it out and like occasionally she'll like um like poke her head out of the the carriage probably then get yelled at and drop like a bunch of peanuts on the street um so <laughs> at one point yeah, the wet peanut shell oh. definitely hits cornet in the face <laughs> 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 And I wouldn't say she gets yelled at. There's a lot of tut tutting though. Like, just, <laughs> oh, oh, it could be people outside, though, too. Uh, oh, <laughs> sure, of course. Uh, and, uh, yes, occasionally uh, sort of a white feathered hand will come over and sort of, ha with a little tiny brush, sort of brush away things that you put on the upholstery and occasionally even on your shirt and things like that. Uh, and as you turn to see Miss Feather, she's just sort of like wolfing down oh. uh, a mouse <laughs> hole. You're just seeing the tail sort of disappearing. <laughs> Like, like spaghetti. <laughs> Please, Violet, some decor and as the tail is disappearing into her mouth, some decorum, if you please. Violet like sputters and like sh sheds some more um, peanut shells, and it's just like, de de decor. You want me to de de decorate now? Here, I mean, decorum, I don't have a lot of. Oh, decorum. It is, uh, and then the carriage sort of lurches. Like mm -hmm. uh, it can wait till later. We have arrived as the coachman opens the door and Miss Feather uh, bustles out and sort of uh, waves for the rest of you to follow. Yes. I'll follow directly in step. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Violette, uh, she, instead of, like, taking the stairs of the coach, like, flutters, you know, <laughs> to, the, to the ground. There's probably some kind of, like, the uh, foot... Um, like dance step, like um, mm. put in there, and she like quickly overtakes Coronet and Mrs. Feather in her excitement to go inside. And uh, as you overtake, you do hear more tut tutting, like boo, 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 boo. Uh, and you see that two other carriages are arriving at the same time. Essentially, you all uh, converge uh, as Hortense and Mr. Whisker step out of one carriage. And Mr. Horn and Callalily exit a third. Ah, Whisker, good to see you, mm, Horn. As they nod to each other, and they both turn to Miss Feather. Miss Feather. Ah, good morning, Miss Feather. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Ah, and I see you have your wards with you as well. So all of you, the four of you, uh, are basically standing there together as your mentors uh, begin briefly discussing something amongst themselves. They're speaking in sort of hushed tones. You do do hear a few legal terms and things like you know, <laughs> Mostly it's talking about uh, have certain merger. accounts been paid yet. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's legal buzzwords. Just yeah. like merger. <laughs> Objection. Uh, While they also, were uh, like introducing themselves to each other, uh, Violette was definitely mocking them behind their back. <laughs> Like, the Mr. Whisker voice definitely gives me ASMR tinglies. So every time you talk, I'm just like, ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do you, you, you uh, four are familiar with each other. You have uh, not grown up in the same household together, but you've certainly, you've been to each other's birthday parties uh, <laughs> and you've known each other since you were children. You uh, were probably also in certain areas, uh, like certain basic areas in your early education, reading and such, uh, schooled together. So how do our the four characters we've met so far greet each other? Uh, Violet will go up to Calla Lily, probably like almost immediately, notice all of the new ribbons, comment on them, and then attempt to steal one. <laughs> <laughs> Calla Lily is just very like, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, give me... Hmm. Ooh, a roll. Sure, do you want to try? A, yeah, let's try stealth. Uh, stealth, I can do that. I can, mm -hmm. I can roll a stealth to just, to just give a little look. See. 
And I believe you're trained in it, too. I right? am, yes. You so, are trained? Um, I rolled a 15, and I get a plus 7 to stealth. So that's Whoa. 22. Uh <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's quite is in the stealthy. name, everybody. <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's see. Callily, uh, give me perception. I have to beat a 20 what? <laughs> oh, wait. I think... Hmm. Oh, uh, that's that's me defaulting. <laughs> that's me defaulting again. I'm going to just say, with a 22 stealth, yes, you have secured a ribbon. Any particular okay. ribbon that you'd like to get? Um, I think that um, because we are like familiar with each other, there's definitely one that Violette can tell is like newer. Um, and because she's a little brat, um, she wants the new shiny thing. <laughs> um, so that would have, whichever one is like, uh, she's not familiar with, she's like, oh, that one. And so she maybe like goes up and is like looking at Calilities and like complimenting them and then like take one and then like just compliments another one as though that didn't happen. <laughs> Shoves it in like a pocket. It's hanging out a little bit really obviously. <laughs> the the newest one is definitely like a light blue with silver thread in there. Mm, and now mm. it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cornette will go up to Hortense and in a familiar gesture, uh, greetings to you. Hortense does the gesture back a little bit awkwardly. She looks very nervous. Mm. Ah, and uh, he pulls out a small pamphlet uh, and hands it over to uh, Hortense. And on it, you can see written, uh, have you seen the light of Saren Ray? And it's just various <laughs> like religious texts, but it's like to help you get on with your day and like have a little meditative moment. And he has done this many, many yep. times. <laughs> <laughs> He's been writing these. <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay, so she does see it's a new one, and she's mm. like, it's a distraction, and just starts reading, and a little nod, and is just like, if I'm reading, I'm distracted, I don't have to think about going out into the world and <laughs> being, doing scary things. Yes, yeah. my sayings are helping. <laughs> Callie's just uh, so excited. She's just like, <laughs> waving to everyone, and it's like, oh, I'm so excited to be around all of you. I offer you some peanuts. Oh, um, I... Anybody want a peanut? No? Okay. Uh, and I realize I've made a bit of an error. I'm going to say that that stealth roll that you rolled magnificently earlier on was essentially for you to sidle up, but I guess I will need a thievery roll. Oh, no, no, okay. Yeah. My bonus is the same, but we could be, we could fail here. The, the, mm -hmm. dice, can, the dice can mm -hmm. always challenge us. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I get a 23. Uh, oh, nice. So uh, I think it's better. fine. I think, I, mean... <laughs> I think we're fine. I think we're fine. Distracting uh, with peanuts. <laughs> and it's at this point that with the four of you on uh, the cusp of maturity, reaching uh, apparently a milestone in your education, we flash back to the first time that the four of you encountered each other. The first time that the four of you were together, some years ago. We mentioned that you probably had some of your early education together. So let's say that this is like an elementary school classroom, essentially. Each of you were tutored in various subjects by the three members of the firm. Uh, Ms. Feather did most of the early education, so she is essentially your school teacher. But would anyone like to take the lead in describing the four of you at a young elementary age? I think there was a marked difference in Violette. Um, for one, um, she still has gray, fluffy feathers uh, of childhood. Um, and for two, she is like half hiding behind Coronet um, a lot of the time. And um, obviously, Xander, like you can, but I think they kind mm -hmm. of swap sometimes, like yeah. one of them hiding behind the other. Mischievous. Um, and the, now, because they haven't maybe defined themselves with their uh, clothing and mannerisms as much, they look identical. Yes. Yeah. You can't tell them apart. So, yeah, they, um, Violette is, is a lot quieter. Um, they, like, she will 
like whisper to um coronet and then they'll like nod and like have that kind of like twin like eye vision like eye communication thing um and just they were much much more like attached at the hip um before and in direct contrast cornet's out in front and is one of those chatty kids who's just going on and on telling you did you know that today that violet had this for lunch and then later on we were going to go to the park and then we we're going to have dinner together and then we we're going to go and do this at the, at the just like of course because this predates his vow of silence exactly mm -hmm. uh what about hortense uh hortense is uh just sort of goofy poofy kitten and <laughs> just like kind of short and stubby but like has that kitten energy and is very similar to cornet just like well i read this and this is super exciting and did you know this fact about this thing and, and this and this and this so i feel like the two of them probably they're like ai it. speaking to each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it just it just clearly is so excited to just keep shoving knowledge in her brain but once it's there she just has to talk about it because it's so exciting and don't you want to know this too and doesn't it make you so excited to learn this thing and yeah she, she just like school probably an embarrassing amount <laughs> and what about calla lily calla lily is much shorter um but she is still taller than the other three um her horns are probably about this long at this point oh. and she has very rounded pink face, very like flushed cheeks, um, a deep, much deeper pink. And um, she is just listening and, and just trying to absorb everything that everyone's saying because she is, she, she's around other people her own age and she's very just like, oh, that's what Violet had for lunch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, um, I'm gonna have a sandwich. Um, and and yeah, tell me more about that book. I want I want to know more more, more about that that book. <laughs> and I think that all of you, including Coronet, will like find seeds and peanuts and things like that in your pockets from where <laughs> Violet <laughs> like like reverse pickpocketed you and like <laughs> things like nice things in your pocket. <laughs> and as this burble of. Uh, childish uh, enthusiasm and laughter is going on. Uh, from the front of the classroom, there's a sharp rap on the chalkboard with a talon as Ms. Feather says, your attention, please. And we cut to the present where she is doing the same thing. Your attention, please. <clears throat> now then, uh, I was about to call you children, but I suppose we must break ourselves of that habit. Young ones. Yes, young ones. Are you all prepared? We have someone for you to meet. Like a partner or? Hmm, yes, partner, teammate, uh, work acquaintance if you prefer. Ready as I'll ever be. And Violette does like a bow. <laughs> and at this, Miss Feather goes, hmm, yes. Meanwhile, inside, in the offices of Feather, Whisker, and Horn, in a well appointed waiting room, comfortable chairs, uh, a liquor cabinet to one side, rows of books in shelves. Another individual is looking out the window and seeing this group gathered outside. Eliza, could you describe Pagasi for us? Sure can. Pagasi is a tall uh, collection of tree exo exoskeletons. Um, there are three tree barks that are connected by a shared root foot. And at the top, beautiful golden uh, bunches of leaves kind of just spraying outward from those three exoskeletons. About halfway, midway down the main center trunk is an orb that is kind of, I guess, when you talk to this tree person, what you would consider the face and the brain. 
And the orb kind of like looks like the expanses of space with stars dotting it and floating in that orb. And then there are also branches um, coming out from either side of all the exoskeletons, but two main branches outside of the front kind of denote arms. And that is what Pegasi looks like. And how does Pegasi locomote? You would see whenever Pegasi moves anywhere, those shared, that shared root foot kind of like pulls them along the ground. Kind of like if you imagine like a, a, a spider or a snail, but tree roots sort of, moving. Yeah, sort of undulation. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Pegasi uh, perceives uh, not a knock, but a sort of a throat clearing behind them. <clears throat> yes. Uh, you perceive... A rat-like humanoid, uh, sort of a hunched over position, wearing a, a very, not necessarily shabby suit, but one that was purchased at a very economical price and then has been worn a lot. Certainly well cared for, but uh, you know you can see it's getting like a little thin at the elbows and whatnot. Um, is there anything that you need? I don't believe so. I am looking forward to meeting my future compatriots. Would you, would you like some water? No, I've had enough sunshine this morning. I am quite full. Oh, is that, is that, is that what you eat? Yes. Makes it kind of hard to offer you something when you're a guest, I suppose. It's just like, just go stand outside. I suppose. You could always offer me a nice patch of grass to soak in the sunshine. That is oh. always appreciated. We, we don't have any of those in here. I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Gigfit, by the way. Um, my partner said I should, I should make you comfortable, get you anything that you needed. Thank you. I am quite well. Yeah. So, kind of, kind of makes me a fifth wheel, doesn't it? So. Does it? Well, I you don't need anything. I was told to get you what you need and help you. I could just engage you in conversation. Do you like to talk? Do you like conversation? I love to talk. What would you like to talk about? I have many thoughts um, that I like to express using words. I have, I have so many questions. I have so many questions. Um, But I don't want to be rude, so I don't know where to start. I do not know what you consider rude, but... Um, I'm going to be up front. I've, I've never met a Conrasu before. Uh, your people, um, they, I, I mean, you're, you're beautiful. I want to say that. That's just that quite the orb there. But Thank you. But what brought you here? The partners, they were, they were not very forthcoming. They rarely are. Well, I suppose they recruited me. I have traveled far from my land, the Mwangi Expense, as you call it. Mm -hmm. and I didn't I was, know that. Yes, I was looking to gather more information about the many different forms of life and culture. Wait, wait a minute, I'm a form of life? Yes. I could, I could help you out. What do you want to know? Well, you are... What is your... What are you called? Oh, uh, rat folk. Right. But, uh, I'm I'm called Gigvit. That's my name. Yes, Gigvit. Where does your name come from, Gigvit? Oh, it was my uncle's name, the one they don't talk about. Tell me about this uncle, and you see we don't, we don't talk about him. <laughs> you see Pegasi roll towards Gigvit, very intrigued. <laughs> well. I mean, I'm an open book, you know. I'm I'm just working my way up, you know. Doing doing it with with elbow grease, as they say. Elbow grease? No, it's not literal. I don't have greasy elbows. I'm very careful about that. Do I have greasy elbows? I don't. And do you have elbows? I they raise their branch arm and look oh, at where it bends and bends it back and forth. You hear the creaking of a tree branch. I guess that's kind of an elbow. I'm not really sure. Um, 
maybe I've 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 just been running my mouth. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you, um, you sure you don't want some water? If it pleases you, you may splash water on my roots. It would give me something to do as he sort of runs over. He gets a, a pitcher of water and pours a glass. And then he just sort of like comes over and it's like, like this, like that. Is that good? That is a nice sprinkle. Very refreshing and enjoyable. I'm going to just keep this up then. As you all hear, you both hear rather, uh, a rap on the door. As Mr. Horn sort of bustles in. Ah, yes, uh, Gigvit, you've been attending to our guest, I see. Oh, you bet. You see, I'm I'm earning my keep. I'm 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 doing the water thing. I'm not just sitting around talking about myself. But I I didn't really ask if you were. All right, <clears throat> Pegasi, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Hmm. I would like to make some introductions, if I may. You are, of course, acquainted with Mr. Feather. Sorry, with Ms. Feather and uh, Mr. Whisker. Uh, the two of them enter. It's like, oh, yes, Pegasi. Pegasi. How has Gigvit been treating you? Quite well. I want to learn all about Gigvit's secret uncle. <laughs> I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have brought that up. I really, we don't talk about it. I'm very and... intrigued by this uncle. <laughs> uh, perhaps later, perhaps later. Uh, you may enter, young ones, as the four of you are escorted into this room. And you see before you, as described, a Konrasu, which I'm pretty sure, I'm, I don't think any of you would have encountered a Konrasu mm. at this point. But could I make a uh, lore academia check to see if I've read about them? Yes, mm. yes, you may. Ooh, that is a 12. <laughs> a 12 total or 12 on the die? 12 total. Uh, perhaps glancing references, like the closest, like it's probably just like very surface. It was probably probably something like tree people. <laughs> and, you know, that's, uh, but there are, of course, you know, other entities which might fit that description as well. So that's that's what you have. Yeah, Hortense is wearing like a long, now that she's dressed, she's wearing like a long coat that sort of, it hangs awkwardly, like there's weight in places you wouldn't expect weight, and she starts rifling through, and you can see it's actually lots of pockets in all of these little journals with all of her notes, so it's like she's clearly looking for notes that she's taken on tree people and then can't find it, and then realizes she's kind of being rude and stops doing that and stands at attention. I yeah, you're sort of like, you know, a page with like a dryad on it sort of flutters to the floor as as you're rifling through your files. I think Violette uh, just like, you know, kind of rushes into the room. They say like here, uh, in they introduce um, Pegasi and Violette's like, where? And like goes <laughs> to the tree and starts looking for acorns um, <laughs> and doesn't notice the orb um, or that it was moving um, at all. And like looks behind the tree and it's just like, are you seeing things? Are you I, I mean I know you're old, but Um Violet, Violet, uh, this this is Pegasi. With that cornet will sort of come up to gently restrain Violet and pull her back to see the forest for the trees, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and then Cornette will gesture up towards uh, Pegasi as if asking for permission to touch the bark. Uh, yeah, you perceive a slight nod. And... Cornette touches the bark of Pegasi and there is a magical sort of activation uh, and echoing throughout Pegasi's mind. You hear a voice that is not coming from Cornette's mouth, but rather a message spell. Uh, that is put into the, the mindscape. Greetings. My name is Cornette, and I have taken a vow of silence and dedication to my god, Serenray. This is my sister, Violette. Sorry for any rudeness that may have occurred. Are you able to understand my gestures? And with that, the body of Cornette will sort of gesture forward. Oh, yes. I... I understand you perfectly. Nice to meet you, Cornette and Violette. 
Oh, was Coronet apologizing for me again? You don't have to do that, Coronet, really. Like, I wasn't being that rude. It's it's perfectly fine for someone to not notice that there was a being where there wasn't a being before. Like, that happens all the time. By the way, I'm Violet and, and bows, like, with a lot of uh, extra, you know, wing movement and, and feather fl- uh, fluttering. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I... Um, uh, you might know about me. You might have you might have heard about me because I'm I'm quite uh, well known uh, in in some circles. Um, I have not. <laughs> you play feathers. <laughs> Instant. Well, I haven't heard of you either. So. <laughs> that is not surprising. I am fairly new to Absalom. Um, I'm Hortense, uh, Hortense Bricklepaw, but just, uh, Hortense is fine. Um, are you, are you okay with paper being around? Is that, like, offensive <laughs> <laughs> or anything? Um, I am not easily offended, you will find. And I it's, understand. It's a good, the... it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> I, I yes. just wanted to not, you know, I don't want to look like I'm just carrying a bunch of you know, dead bits of dead people or anything, so. It is more like my clothing, this trunk, mm. these roots, these these leaves. I am this. And uh, they kind of like, yeah, point towards the orb. This is my essence contained by this tree or what you perceive as a tree. Okay. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, Hortense. It's like, it's like you're walking around with like a pile of pants or something <laughs> <laughs> um well hi uh my name is calla lily you can call me lily or Cal- uh, what, whatever you you like um i like your out- outfit thank you i like your outfit as well oh thank you <laughs> so um you you wear trees yes it the way that you wear your skin and flesh is how I wear this exoskeleton. Oh. Maybe so, not exactly the same way that I wear my flesh. No, not exactly the same. Looks slightly disturbed. <laughs> Does that mean I'm carrying around a bunch of skin? I think... Uh, Sorry. <clears throat> I, I um, like the, I like the pants analogy better. I gotta be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as lovely as it is uh, to meet you, um, was there a reason why we we're all at this at the firm? Um, <clears throat> Indeed, there is. Indeed, there is. As mentioned, it is time for you all to take on some more responsibility. Indeed, uh, you have all done well studies and shown much promise but the time comes when everyone must and she sort of leans towards cornet and violet hmm? leave the nest as it were hmm? eh? a gesture of i see what you did there <laughs> <laughs> yeah and she she sort of picks up and like she she just thinks that she just made the best joke ever and she also thinks that you thought that was hilarious <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, well, uh, leaving such colorful metaphors behind us, uh, we will speak plainly. The firm has certain tasks that need to be performed. However, we cannot entrust all such tasks to mm, random hirelings. We find it best to use those we can trust. And who might we trust more than all of you? Mm? He turns uh, to Calla Lily. You have proven yourselves trustworthy. And such, as such, we shall set a certain task before you. We also ask that you take into your number Pagasi, recently arrived and a stranger in this land. However, we do understand that throwing a, shall we say, new 
team member into a workforce can sometimes prove disruptive, and so we thought it best to first introduce you all and then see how you function as a unit. Hmm? Um, I would like to say when um, uh, Mr. Horn uh, says trustworthy, um, Violette is going to like edge toward the closest, no, Gigvit, definitely Gigvit, and <laughs> attempt to pickpocket them. <laughs> okay, give me thievery, please. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I'm well. a thief, okay. Also, did everyone else's eyes go to Violet when? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we we're all watching this happen. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah, Mr. Horn was definitely looking at Callie Lily and sort of acknowledging that, yes, you have proven trustworthy, but yes. He, uh... um, I got a 15 on that one. <laughs> a 15, you say? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah, you do, you get. You know, you know how in cartoons when somebody opens up their wallet and a moth flies out? Yeah. That's basically what you get. A moth. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes. So uh, It was Gigvit. Uh, it was Gigvit, yeah. yeah. Violet, like, reaches into Gigvit's pocket, like, finds something, like, fluttering in there, like, pulls it out. It's a moth. Eats it. Um... <laughs> Oh, I was saving that moth for later. No. no, no. <laughs> uh, so all of you uh, are essentially, uh, you can see uh, Ms. Feather is sort of gesturing for you all to sit down. <clears throat> Front of class. <laughs> Let us begin with an evaluation, a self-evaluation of your abilities. What would you say is your and it's very much a, like a work interview situation. What would you say is your greatest strength? <laughs> As she pulls out uh, a notebook and a long quill. And Cornette, turns, she, fir she first turns to Cornet as she often does. And Cornet gestures, the ability to listen. Hmm. Very good. Turns to Violette. Violette had already started to execute a complex series of like flips and roundabouts in the office. This, um, this is the interview portion. You the interview <laughs> portion here. Well, you asked me to show you what my greatest strengths are. Very well, enthusiasm. There we are. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, now then, uh, Caroline. Um, I can do this, and she whistles really loud, and a um. <laughs> A little green dragon shows up <laughs> and just starts floating around her. Now, how does this dragon manifest? Is, it, is there like, you know, is it, uh, you know, Marvel style? Is there like an, uh, an orange door that opens and it comes out? Does it just puff into air? How does it just this... kind of puffs into the air? Mm -hmm. She whistles. And, <laughs> and what is this dragon uh, whimsical? Is it tiny but fierce? What does it look like? It is, um, it is green. It sort of has the sort of long snaky body. I guess it's more of like a worm in that, but it is, it's a, it's a cunning dragon, but it's sparkly and it's green and it's pretty <laughs> small. Um, but that's just cause we're indoors and not in combat. Mm -hmm. I'm picturing hmm. it looks like a windsock sort of. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of floating around and it'll settle on her shoulder. And uh, you hear uh, Mr. Horan go, mm, well done. Uh, yes, yes, most impressive, most impressive. Uh, Hortense. Well, um, research and knowledge recall, and um, uh, I guess, and almost like she doesn't want to act like she has other skills, sort of twists her hands and uh, past uh, dancing lights. So a few Ooh. globes of light appear. Um, and I also have, you know, daggers and things. <laughs> and you hear uh, Mr. Whisker sort of not, uh, chuckling approvingly. But mostly research. That's what I'm best at, research. Yes, yes, I'm sure that your skills will find application. And you, Pegasi, what is your greatest strength, the greatest asset to a team? I would say that I have two. One you have always already witnessed when I was recruited in the town square, lecturing on philosophical law and cosmological nature and balance. Mm. Indeed, and so, uh, most intriguing I found it as well. 
Yes, I would say that first strength is thinking through complex things and matters and existentialism and purveying those thoughts and ideas through language. I am also very verbose, I have been told. <laughs> you, not at all. I find your verbosity to be completely average when one takes various <laughs> factors into account. Noted. <laughs> the other yes. strength is I can create things from my sap, from my exoskeleton. I can create explosives. Oh. Mm. What? Rather, rather dramatic. Mm, interesting. Would you like to see? Uh, well, perhaps yeah. not. Perhaps not in here. <laughs> yes. Yes, of course, Miss mm. Feather. Wise. Oh. Very well, all parties have been heard from. Uh, now we shall ask another question. What would you say is your greatest weakness? None, oh, I have none, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, please do wait your turn, Violet. Mm. <laughs> Cornet, I'm impatience. There we are. <laughs> Cornet. Mm. Cornet thinks for a while and then does a, a custom gesture, meaning Violet. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, mm. And you get a very sort of commiserating look from Miss Feather. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, yes, I, uh. <laughs> and yes. Uh, and what of you, Violet? Or shall we just keep impatience down? You want me to give you my greatest weakness? I would never supply my enemies with the ability to destroy <laughs> me. Mm. No, I'll give you points for a creative answer. <laughs> Hortense. Um, probably lack of practical application of everything I've ever learned. Uh, and you hear Mr. <laughs> Mr. Whisker chuckles again. It's like, mm, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and Keller Lily. Uh, Calla Lily just kind of like looks at Mr. Horn, like what? What should I say? And he's sort of like, don't don't look at me. It's like, uh, uh, do answer the question, Calla Lily, uh, as you see it. Uh, what are areas that might be improved upon? Um. Um, I uh, I haven't left the house much. <laughs> <laughs> haven't that... left. The house, my mm, relative inexperience, shall we say? Very good. Mm. And Pegasi. I would say that my weakness is I. Hmm. Well, my weakness is sometimes my thoughts are too big, mm. and I do not understand. Uh, the lives of others. For instance, when I first met a humanoid after leaving my home forest, I did not understand that your fingers are not branches and they cannot be regrown if you oh. lose them. Hmm. In most cases, no. No, certainly not without the use of rather expensive magics. Yes. But you know that now, yes? You do know that now. I do understand that now. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, good. Um, did you find that out from experience, or did you just ask? What is a more comforting answer to <laughs> Maybe we'll just let that one lie. <laughs> okay. that, means, that means experience. <laughs> huh. Well, I'm glad I... I didn't have to answer anything. Now, what do you see as your greatest? I, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. He already has a job. Now then, the next stage that we shall move on to is more practical than the interview. If you would join me in the courtyard. And she gets up. The other two uh, also escort themselves out. You see Gigbit has already made himself scarce. Do you linger in the room? Do you say anything to each other? Mm. They didn't say join us in the courtyard. Mm. Um, definitely. And they, they, a, they do say at your leisure, essentially. So there was definitely you have a time. point during the conversation when Pegasi was talking about like lecturing in the courtyard when Violette was like, ugh, snore. 
And a lot of these like internal thoughts are projected towards Coronet. Like you yeah. must know everything I'm feeling at every moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as soon as um, Fagasi said explosives, now Violet is just like trying to like looking at them as though like her eyes could make them explode. Like, <laughs> like, what so um she's kind of like shadowing pegasi and like just there was a curiosity when she found out that pegasi was a, a being and not a plant and now there's the additional curiosity of explosives um so yeah um violette is definitely like flitting around just examining um probably very invasive um personal space wise like a bird fluttering a little too close to your face <laughs> uh, Hortense has sort of come up and there's a little bit of that uh, kitten energy back again as she uh, comes up to Pegasi and she's like well how often do you give lectures do you have any pamphlets uh, Cornette could probably help you make some if you want to make pamphlets but I'd be very interested to hear your perspective on things I would love to share my perspective on things and also hear yours I was giving daily lectures uh, basically all day as long as there was sunshine in the town square. But now that schedule will change because I seem to have been employed by the claw firm with you all. So, TBD. <laughs> she pulled out a notebook and looks a little disappointed and hugs it back. Callow, uh, I and Oh, please go ahead. Oh, Callie will just run up and just be like, so I was once a stranger to this place too, you know, um, so we can, we can talk about that. And um, it's just really, it's just really nice to, to, to meet someone like you, because I've never met anyone like you before. And, and you seem really interesting. And like, you might have been other places and seen a lot of things. Thank you. I find you very interesting as well. And I have never met anyone like you. Oh, really? But you met Mr. Horn. Are you the same type of person? Um, I mean, we're both uh, tieflings. Oh. Ah, oh, I see it now. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the horns kind of give it away sometimes. Yes, the horns. I She's see. better with ribbons, though. Yes, the ribbons. I thought you grew, you don't grow those ribbons? Oh, no. The I, I, grow, I grow this, and I'm like, pull my hair, but then I will be, yeah. but I don't grow this. And I'll like reference a ribbon. I see. Mm. How fascinating. I grow this violet butts in and like hands you a feather that drops off. <laughs> oh, you grow leaves as well. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, and Pegasi will actually like stick the feather into their bushel of <laughs> leaves oh. up top. Nice. Looks good uh, on you. Now, and Pegasi will you... actually just take a golden leaf and hand you one as well. Oh. Feel it. Oh. Well, I am going to stick it in my feathers. It's like a Yay. little tree. Hmm. Hortense looks, but she doesn't really have anything that comes off easily. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of you heard uh, Pegasi use the term claw firm earlier. Now, you're all aware of this term. Uh, you are aware that Ms. Feather and Mr. Horn do not like that nickname for the firm. <laughs> uh, feather, feather, Whisker, and Horn is how they always refer to it. Oh, uh, Mr. told me that name. Yeah, and, and oh, yeah. Mr. Whisker as well, although Mr. Whisker apparently finds it amusing uh, and sometimes uses it uh, uh, just to get a rise out of the other two. But uh, you all are aware of that, that this law firm is, it, uh, is sometimes referred to as the claw firm. Mm -hmm. uh, do any of you make Pegasi aware of that? Maybe not this time, but if it happens again, maybe. <laughs> Calla Lily probably will. Uh, She'll just be like, oh, by the way, I heard you say the term claw firm and just, it's not, um, Mr. Horn doesn't like that one very much. Um, he's much more of, a, it's a law firm. It's it's a nickname that he has no part in. Ah, thank you for letting me know. Would it have been rude for me to say that in front of Mr. Horn? Oh no, I mean you didn't know. Um, did did Whisk did Mr. Whiskers tell you that? 
Yes, I overheard Mr. Whisker and Gigvit saying that term. Well, um, it's more their nickname for it. Ah. Mr. Whisker likes uh, puns more than the other partners, I think. It's because you all have claws. Ah. <laughs> ah. Ah. I'm glad you know what puns are. I feel like that would be hard to explain. I am still learning. <laughs> this is so, um, so what about the explosions? Interrupting everybody. <laughs> well, and then Cornet will pull you along <laughs> to go uh, out to the courtyard. <laughs> yeah, following along uh, as we go outside. I can show you once we're outside. If that's what we're doing next. Even if it's not, I think you still should. <laughs> <laughs> And when you all reach the courtyard, uh, you do find that uh, the partners and Gigvit are all waiting for you out there. And there are a number of objects set up, some of which are roughly humanoid shaped, uh, some of which actually have, you know, the traditional sort of targets on them. Ah, oh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, some more practical applications of your various skills and abilities. Mm, Pegasi, uh, the other young ones seemed quite interested in your mention of mm, explosives, uh, as I might have uh, suspected. So, perhaps we should begin with you this time. Gladly. And I'll do this narratively first. Mm, of course. <laughs> um, you see... Pagasi kind of scrapes some bark and take a bit of root off of their trunk and roots and then drip some sap from a branch into them and then form them with her branch hands into a ball. And then, now let's figure out how to do alchemy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... Um, uh, if I use quick alchemy to create an infused alchemical item that allows the saving throw, I can change the CC to my class. Okay, that might not matter right now. Um, also, thank you to Demiplane for having these rules yes, handy. Yes, I am yes, mm -hmm, on the Pathfinder I'm, Nexus. Yeah, I'm on the Nexus right now, and it's very nice and easy to find this. So, yeah, clicking on quick alchemy. Do, 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 do. I, I'm going to use one of my formulas, which is, actually, I don't know. Sorry, I'm not sure if I've chosen my, I get four formulas mm. for. Well, we know one of them is explosive. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's canon now. That's canon. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> we will backtrack and find one <laughs> that works that way. Alchemical crafting. I will say, as this is getting set up, Cornette will take a position in front of the other three, uh, and as he raises his robe and feathered hand, he sort of twists it a bit, and catching the light creates a shield, uh, and is going to cast the shield cantrip uh, just out in front. So there's almost like an, uh, a glowing sort of plate that uh, comes in between Cornette, the rest of everybody else, and a, Pegasi. A, a dinner plate? A dinner plate. <laughs> yes. What form does this shield take? Because I think it is visible to the. Yeah. It, yeah. It, I, I envision it as like a translucent shield made of light, as if someone had taken like the lens of a magnifying glass, and it's just reflecting back. Cool. So uh, no particular uh, decoration. It's more more like a say a Green Lantern construct. Exactly. Kind of yes. Okay. Lovely. And uh, mechanically, could you yeah. remind me what are the bonuses uh, to AC for that? Uh, mechanically, it adds one to my AC, but I, it also makes the reaction of shield block available to me. So it has right. basically five HP that I can then use as a quick reaction to block, including like magic missile and things like that. Um, but it will dissipate after it takes that damage. Yeah. Oops, sorry. And so Cornet does step forward. You see this shimmering in the air as uh, you implore, I assume, yes, your Seren Ray, the dawn flower, your mm -hmm. deity, uh, that makes this possible. Is there a particular prayer that you offer to bring this shield into place, or is it more of an emotion yeah. or a feeling? 
Yeah, well, I mean, all of the prayers and emotions are going to be happening internally, and the of thought of these people getting hurt, these these friends, that this family that Cornette has spent his whole life protecting is what's keeping this strong shield of faith up. Very nice. And the others, do you, uh, basically the other three, I guess, uh, Pegasi is out in front because uh, they're about to ex uh, show some explosive alchemy. Uh, do the others stay behind the shield? Um, Vila, having experienced the shield uh, many times, um, gets to exactly the point in the curve of light where um, she gets the most, like, you know, stage light on her. <laughs> oh, yeah. You and feel it. It's like, you found it's like being light. on stage. It's just yeah. like, oh, yeah, there we are. There it yeah. is. Yeah. I find my light as yeah. it were, um, and just like stand there rakishly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hortense Very stands. Nice. Uh, you know, she similarly is familiar with the shield, so she's sort of back a little bit and she's rifling through her pockets. Uh, and finally she pulls out a dagger and anyone who's watching it would seem that she the dagger was actually in one of her notebooks so <laughs> it's a bookmark it out, yeah, she has a dagger and she's just sort of fiddling with that nervously Love. and when you uh, pulled it out like is it like a hollowed out notebook like you know Daryl's oh, yeah, style like a secret like... I mean no it's really just a book she was kind of <laughs> yeah it was just a book hard. It's a thin uh, dagger a yeah book, she doesn't care if like her notes get uh, a little dinged up so the or pull notebook is a little bit bowed now. But. <laughs> and uh, what about Calla Lily? What's Calla Lily doing? Calla Lily touches her chest and casts mage armor. Nice. And then her uh, dragon, she'll like, she points forward and the dragon will pop up and sort of move forward to where she pointed to. And is your mage armor, it's uh, at least uh, transparently visible, I believe. So mm -hmm. what, to, what form does it take? It is, it, she touches your chest and it sort of forms out from her hand and it does look like armor, but it is just almost like an iridescent sheer armor, just like taking, covering her, uh, her nice little frock. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, so, uh, what, what's, uh, color, uh, well, iridescent, so all mm -hmm. colors. Yeah, right? it's sheer, it, it's, it's like a clear if a clear had a had a very uh, rainbow sheen to it, right? It's uh, yeah, so uh, Care Bear armor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's rainbow bright style armor. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh no, then then Crystar the Crystal Warrior. Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we're, or the if new we're Pokemon, for, <laughs> or the new Pokemon. All right. So uh, in the meantime, Pegasi has been uh, has gathered this material and has altered it. How? So, Do we see it physically alter? Or? Oh, yes. You'll see. So once they've created this kind of cocoon of sap, you then see... So I imagine Pegasi has some type of like satchel that is slung around <laughs> their trunk. Uh, and they pull out a small vial, uh, very carefully siphon some of the liquid in the vial into this basically bomb case that they've made and then close it very quickly, put it back away. And they say, I will probably want to, mm, I'll throw it up, upward, <laughs> so that no one is in range. Uh, it's a fairly big courtyard. And as mentioned, there are like a number of like sort of straw dummies and they, you can oh, say, okay. that you can see that these things have been set up to like, uh, use your magic on this, use your, you know, your great. arrows on this. I'll yeah. throw it at one of the straw dummies. Very and well. basically, the idea is this is alchemist's fire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bomb. I'm using the lesser type, uh, level one, so it doesn't do that much damage, but it's still pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, straw and... doesn't have many hit points. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it says alchemist's fire is a combination of volatile liquids that ignite when exposed to air. So basically, when this cracks open on impact, it'll ignite. Um, and then uh, now I don't. Yeah. I don't ahead. have. I don't have the ability in front of me. Will you be making an attack oh. roll or? Yes, it gives me a plus one item bonus to my attack roll. Oh no, sorry. Nope, never mind. I'm doing it at lesser, so it just deals damage, and I'll yes, I can do an attack roll for that. Very well. Okay. And am I doing what kind of attack roll exactly? Uh I from what you said, I believe this would be like a missile attack, right? So you're you're basically throwing like a grenade like object. 
Yeah. So, if it doesn't specifically list it under the ability, under spells. Uh, oh, spells, maybe. Maybe. Oh, uh, maybe if I add the formula. Yeah, there it is. There we go. Alchemist fire lesser, except uh, advance. Okay, I have one loaded up now. Yeah, it still doesn't give me a place to roll, so maybe I don't. Oh, nope, there it is. Roll. And it there says bomb plus three. Okay. Nice. Mm. And I rolled. <laughs> I got a seven total. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you actually go wide of the target, and this will actually <laughs> impact on the uh, the stone wall beside it. Uh, it was it was it was hard to miss uh, a stationary straw dummy, but <laughs> you, you managed. Uh, but accuracy uh, is not my forte, of course. Uh, mm. But what kind of damage do you do? Uh, just so we can see the size of yeah. this burst of. A flame, I assume. Yeah, yeah, it'll be yeah. flame. Um, so I rolled. Is a it one. also concussive or just a flame? Uh, no, there's three types. So there's, uh, I just rolled a one on the fire damage, so one mm -hmm. fire damage, and then one persistent fire damage. So I guess it stays <laughs> lit mm -hmm. on fire, mm -hmm. and then one fire splash damage. So maybe that's. Ooh. Like, oh, okay, we... so I'm going to say that you do actually get the dummy with the splash damage. Okay. Uh, so if the uh, impact point is on the wall beside it, so it goes but like the, the corona of fire that goes out from it actually does catch this thing on fire. And uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, you see Gigvit immediately sort of like run with this bucket of water and sort of throw it <laughs> on things so it doesn't get, and you see that the area around it has been sort of wet down already, but he's just honest like, oh, very impressive, very nice, very nice. <laughs> Yes, indeed. It would seem that mm, your offensive capabilities have not yet been plumbed. Mm, yes. Yes. Well done, Pagasi. Well done. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, now then, are there any other abilities that you think the rest of the team should be made aware of? Or shall we move on? I have other things that I'm not as trained in. Hmm. Anything that you might wish to unleash on one of these fearsome straw men? <laughs> uh, Mr. Horn goes, ah, yes, the straw man argument. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, so, again, reading, learning this as I go. Mm hmm uh, Pagasi pulls out a a bag from from her bag. She's she they by the way. Mm -hmm. um, from her bag, she pulls out another little bag, and she kind of like tightens a little rope that's close holding it closed, and then she's going to throw it at the feet of one of the dummies. And let me load this up so I can see how it works. This is called a Tanglefoot bag. Mmm. Um, except, and, oh, it didn't, oh, there it is, okay. Quick, Tanglefoot bag, okay, and then I will roll, I, I did want to roll physical dice for this. Yeah. Just, but, um, so, uh, six plus three, so nine. <laughs> uh, and the effect this normally has is that it's a little better and, and, and <laughs> it, is, better. It, it is enough to get a stationary oh, uh, straw mannequin yes. great so it says a tanglefoot bag is filled with sticky substances so I'm thinking sap she kind of like mixes alchemical substances with sap to make a lot of these things when you hit a creature with a tanglefoot bag that creature takes a status penalty to its speed for one minute many types of tanglefoot bag also grant an item bonus on attack rolls which I had with the plus three so, so yes, uh, so this stuff, obviously, you're not going to impede its motion because it's, it's <laughs> a straw dummy. Uh, but yes, this stuff sort of like goes out. You can see the, this sort of like webbing like stuff goes out. Uh, and if this thing did have feet that it could move, it wouldn't be moving them right now. It's like, ah, yes, Tanglefoot bag, classic, classic. Uh, you also hear it's like, oh, yes, most impressive, most impressive, Tagasi. Now then. 
young ones. Each of you has abilities which might, hmm, shall we say, be used in combat. Of course, such things are to be avoided, but on occasion, force must be applied. Who would like to go first? Uh, Cornette will stand forward because this is almost like in reaction to what Pegasi's just done. And uh, cool as anything will st uh, sort of uh, wave his hand over the ground. Uh, and as he does, three stones sort of light up with golden energy. Uh, and he'll grab those and then flick them almost as if flicking stones over a lake. Uh, and each of them uh, brightly target this dummy that has been caught in this Tanglefoot bag. And as they try to hit, I have, I'm casting Magic Stone. I'm going to do all three. Lovely. All right. One is a dirty 20. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. 17 and a four. <laughs> uh, one, one goes very wide. One yeah. Goes, it actually hits the same part of the wall that the fire thing hits. <laughs> Yeah, but really, as these things They've really sort of... got something against that one bit of wall. <laughs> uh, so so the other two hit, and what kind of damage do you do? Uh, bludgeoning. Da, da, da. And <clears throat> not a whole lot, but three and two. So five total. Uh, and they just sort of like pew, hit this stone or this dummy that then is caught in the Tanglefoot bag so it can sort of fall over. And uh, how much damage total did you do? Five. Five, yes, that's certainly enough. You actually, like, you know, the head comes loose and it, it sort of loses integrity as it falls to the ground. Hmm. Well done. Very well done indeed, Corbett. Hmm. Um, can I just say that while this was happening, Violet attempts to, like, climb to the second level um, uh, facing the courtyard and she, like runs along the uh, banister and then is going to attempt to like drop on one of them. Yeah. Um, uh, so all of this is done with. So, okay. So were you trying to make like a, a big, a big surprise entrance? So like people. Yeah. Can see yeah. You the, she, so she's first... trying to do the climbing and, and all that, like with nobody watching and then just like, ha, you know? <laughs> okay. First of all, stealth. Okay. <laughs> You're going to need to make a few rolls here. Okay. Uh, so stealth, first of all, to see if you manage to break away from the group. And I mean, there is, there's a good distraction being provided, obviously, because like things are exploding and glowing rocks are flying at things. I get a 21 for stealth. You're pretty sure. Yeah. Nobody knows. Um, and then we run along the banister and um, I have uh, me and uh, me and Cornet are Skyborne Tengu. So I can't mm -hmm. take fall damage because um, mm -hmm. I got these wings. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, she will like jump and do like several flips, land near, um, or attempt to land near one of the, um, straw men and, um, do some more like tumbles, like around while waving her rapier and then, you know, go for the finisher as it were. Okay. So you, your stealth roll was successful. You got you got over there. Now I'm going to need an acrobatics roll for all this fancy footwork, Yippee. and then an attack roll uh, with your rapier, please. Uh, for acrobatics, I got a twenty um, yes. plus right. seven, so that's a twenty-seven. Nice, okay. nice. Oh wait, nat twenty. Nat twenty. Yeah. Okay, yeah. On my acrobatics. Um, yeah. In fact, that, like that's yeah. You uh, of course in Pathfinder, nat twenty right. is not a critic but you did exceed your uh, difficulty by much more than 10. So yeah, you, you, you pull so off impressive. a critical acrobatics. Yeah, there's really nice. flipping, there's rolling, there's other things that people do. Um, <laughs> and then to hit, um, I will attempt, I have, I have panache from doing all these flips in this performance. Mm. Um, boop, boop. And then I'm gonna attempt my like finisher um, on this little guy, because you gotta be confident. Um, <laughs> make a strike with a weapon that you would apply your precise strike damage. Blah blah. blah. Okay. So. 
Uh, so yes, uh, could you describe what particular attack ability that you're using? So um, she fights. She is a she's a swashbuckler. Um, mm -hmm. She fights with a rapier, um, and she like does the flips mid air without the rapier drawn. Um, does like several rolls like around this and through the space of um, like a roll through is what it's called um, through the space of the dummy, and then like draws her rapier and like stabs toward the center chest of the dummy. Mm -hmm. um, I <laughs> I got a four, but I have a plus, <sighs> but I have a plus seven. Okay. But you have a plus seven. Okay, <laughs> which is your, uh, you are fortunate that this is a stationary straw dummy. Uh, so you do hit. I'm hoping uh, that my flare surrounding the attack will kind of like distract people from the, the less fancy attack itself. Style mm -hmm. points. So will the eleven hit? Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. The eleven does hit. So okay. uh, and uh, roll your damage. I will do that. Um, so I get a lot of damage on a finisher because nice. I'm a badass. <laughs> and that deals 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 damage. Whoa! Seventeen damage. Yeah. You basically Double this one. thing. This thing is, uh, you know, just cut in half at the waist. Like, I, you actually went with a thrust, so I think you thrust hard enough that it uh, knocks, like, the, the top half of the abdomen oh, off, yeah. and it's sort of, like, impaled on your sword. And uh, you do hear, yes, you get, there is applause from uh, Mr. Horn and Mr. Whisker. You know, it's sort of like, Mr. Whisker is, like, immediately burst into applause, and Mr. Horn is like, hmm, yes, yes. And you even see Miss oh. Feathers, like, hmm. Yeah. Yes. You see Cornette like unceremoniously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. Very Precise good. strike like... finisher. I'm I'm also learning, but I believe that is the correct way to do it. So I'll take your word for it. Uh -huh. I don't have that. Someone will correct me later. And... I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. I'm sure chat will yell at all of us, <laughs> especially for my my, my mistake on the first roll. Just like they, uh, no, that would be thievery, not stealth. Yeah. So, uh, so we, so there's this little round of applause as the partners turn towards Hortense and Calilla, looking Cal expectantly. She raises her hand. Are we? Is this? Are we doing everything we can do, or are we just doing like our favorites? <laughs> well, uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing the wrong mentor. Uh, well, uh, do you wish to display everything you can do? I mean, we have time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. So, what do you lead with? I Callie points to one of the dummies, and out of her hand. Um, an arc of electricity shoots out, hits a dummy, and skips to the and hits the dummy next to it. Whoa! Very well. So, uh, this is this a to hit roll for you, or is it like a saving throw? Because I believe on... it is a to hit roll. Very good. For me. And which spell are you using in particular? Electric arc. Oh, Very nice. Well. Um, roll that up. See see how successful you are at this. Uh, double hit and for spell attacks do i add something to that i forget i, I believe it should be all accounted for um okay uh that is a 16 on the die oh yeah plus Understood. seven so 23 a palpable hit a palpable hit <laughs> And that will be, I believe it is 1d4. And this will um, be to both, the same damage to both dummies? Uh, yeah, it doesn't say that it's different. Okay. Um, I assume it is the same. So that will be five points of damage. Uh, so the first dummy that gets hit uh, basically explodes as this arc hits the next one. It is also demolished. Hmm. And then yes. she'll, oh, she'll give a little nod. She'll look at some rocks on the ground and then telekinetically uh, projectile them at a different dummy. As a bonus, because oh, it's 
So electric arc, I believe, is a one action, is two the, action spell. Are we doing? Are we do? Is this an a proper round, or are we just kind of going for it? Uh, if you wanted to make it so, like if uh, so, it's two actions for uh, electric arc. Yes. That means that you've got one action left. Oh, okay. Uh, so I you could sure you could also like just actually... take your time. Like I'll do this. You, you did say exploration mode. Yeah. 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 I wasn't you said sure that you wanted to do everything. So I do, but I can wait. I can wait my turn. Uh, I mean, it's essentially the floor is yours. So you basically you do this, and then you mm -hmm. you know you move to the next dummy. And we can assume it's like a new round as reset, so you've got your three actions again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, then on this second one, I will projectile some rocks at a different dummy. <laughs> Very well. And that is another spell attack. Eh, that's not as great. That is a six plus seven, so that is a 13 to hit. Certainly enough to hit this dummy. It I is... mean, it's pretty hard to miss the dummy. It is. <laughs> um, that will be seven Good thing points... there was splash damage. On the, on the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, seven points of damage. Ooh, seven points of damage. This one is also destroyed by this hail of rocks. And then for, I guess I'll just do this. I'll point to, as I'll move over to the next dummy, point to my dragon point it at the dummy and the dragon will um, breath weapon it. Very well. I will let you roll for your familiar or for your dragon. Uh, that is actually a... Do you prefer familiar or dragon pal? Um, <laughs> familiar works. <laughs> dragon pal's cute though. Mm -hmm. um, so that is actually a reflex save against my spell. So... It automatically fails. <laughs> not having reflexes at all. And that will be uh, <laughs> one point of damage. And uh, what kind of damage is it? Fire, I assume? It is... Um, that is a good question. Also, just so we don't get yelled at, they're called Eidolons. The they are. Things they are Eidolons. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Eidolons. It's okay. <laughs> I, just, I say we go with Dragon Pal. Dragon Pals could easier. work. Yeah. Mine just, it just says destructive energy. Okay, so... Uh, oh, it's acid. That, okay, so uh, this straw begins to sizzle and uh, uh, dissolve as the acid works its way through it. And uh, are you continuing with any of this? <laughs> or? I, think I'll, I think I'll let this lie. She will just bow at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, very proudly, Mr. Horn's like, yes, <laughs> yes, well done, Kevin well done. Ah, mm -hmm. That's my girl. And that means that Mr. Whisker now looks over at Hortense. As well, my dear. Hortense looks nervous, and she's been fiddling with the dagger, but if you've been watching, she's actually fiddling with it quite skillfully and kind of rolling it over her fingers and sort of looks at everybody, and she especially looks at Violet, and she feels like like she's calculating in her head. And are any of the dummies sort of like obscured by some of the smoke or any of the shenanigans that have just happened? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, one of them's on fire. There's one that's being dissolved in acid. Uh, so yeah, there's certainly some of them that are obscured. They'd set up a fair number of them. Okay, so Hortense is gonna sort of do a flippy flip, maybe not as extravagant as Violet, but like to show she, you know, has some acrobatic skills and uh, get within 10 feet of one of the dummies that's hidden through a cloud of smoke. And then she's going to hurl a dagger uh, and use uh, the shooting star spell as she does. Very well. Uh, so you said uh, you want to do a little bit of acrobatic footwork. Uh, give me yeah. acrobatics, please. That is 15 for acrobatics. Oh, sorry, 14 for acrobatics. Uh, certainly, you know, serviceable, well-executed acrobatic move. Perhaps, as you mentioned, without the extravagant flair uh, that is uh, sort of uh, more Violet's uh, calling card. But uh, your attack roll now with the shooting star spell, you can essentially uh, move it uh, so that it, uh, I believe it automatically hits, yes? Uh, no, I do the uh, attack roll. 
Oh, least. okay. But what yeah. does it, what, sorry, what advantage does Shooting Star give you? Uh, it ignores concealment, it reduces cover, and if the strike hits, it sort of leaves a meteor trail, so those effects last for anyone else who's also attacking the same target. Okay, so... And that is a 15 that a to hit. Certainly uh, enough to hit, and it does look like, because of the concealment, it looks like a particularly difficult target to hit. But this streak of light uh, behind your dagger lights it up, and... Even though we've technically finished with our demonstration, if anyone wants to uh, take advantage of the effects of the Shooting Star spell, they certainly can. I mean, if you're going to set Vi Violet up, then Violet's going to follow through. Um, Violet also has daggers. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, she sees, I think that we've, I mean, we've all practiced, but we've been together for a while. Um, so this is just like second nature at this point. Um, she, uh, having backed off, for the acid attacks and everything, like also approaches the same one. And basically from over Hortense's shoulder, like maybe she jumps and flutters a bit to get like a little bit of height and then like throws a dagger as well. Um, now question, of course, your wings are also your arms. Is that correct? Yes. So, All right, so you're gonna I, sort of I, jump up and then. It's just, it's, 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 a, it's basically a jump, a little bit of mm -hmm. fluttering and then, you know. And then, and then basically then. on the way down of your Arc, yes. you, yeah, yes. you release your weapon. Great. So this will be a straight attack roll. No worries for concealment. The the shooting star spell takes care of that. Okie dokie. Let's see if we can do this one because I don't have panache left over. But I get a 13 plus 7 to hit. So that's 20. I think I manage. You did indeed manage. Please roll your damage. Um, I For this, it's for and that, it's, it's not as much. Yeah. Roll damage, did I? Um, I just do two damage, um, but I think her main attempt was just to get the dagger to land, like, right where Hortense's dagger also landed. Um, it was and, more about the show. And actually, Hortense, you're right. You did not roll damage, so you've got two right. damage. What what did you, was your damage? Six damage. Also two damage? For Sorry? Six. For six damage. So actually, your first hit did sort of, like, knock the top off, and so uh, your second hit is, like, you're aiming at what's left, so you like at like the pelvis and legs, basically. And it also hits in in a sort of area that the you see Mr. Whisker and Mr. Horn sort of go ooh when it hits, uh, and it falls over. Very impressive indeed. Yes, it is as I say. The teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> hmm. Yes. Yes. Very impressive, all of you. It is clear you have not been ignoring your studies nor your practice. And this is good. We are going to require you to act as, shall we say, the hand of our firm. We will need you to act in our stead. Of course, we are very busy and have court appearances to deal with, so... On occasion, we will need you as we need you today. We want you to take a certain item to a client of ours. There has been some litigation concerning this item and its ownership, but we believe to have resolved it in a satisfactory manner. However, you should know there may be, shall we say, disgruntled parties who are not particularly pleased with the way that matters have resolved themselves. Hmm? Do you understand my euphemisms? <laughs> there may be fisticuffs, is what I'm saying. Hmm. Don't they care now, about the law? Hmm, sadly, my dear, not all hold the law in such esteem as we do. Violet, when when they says, "Don't they care about the law?" Violet like snickers under her wing, like. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Miss Feather sort of takes that into it, like she's you know, like not everyone holds the law in such esteem as looks over at Violet. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we of course would not wish to send you into hmm, well battle unprovisioned, and as such, we will make any equipment. 
that you need available to you. And uh, it will be a bit of a journey. Uh, the client in question does not reside within Absalom, but rather in the countryside. So when I mentioned field trip, uh, it quite literally is a trip to a field. Uh, or uh, uh, some, I'm sure there'll be some bushes and trees as well. Um, yes. Valerie raises her hand and looks at Mr. Horn. Does, does, um, does that mean I can stay out past curfew? Ah, uh, yes, Carolily, I believe that um, <clears throat> the time for curfews may have passed. <clears throat> he says that somewhat begrudgingly. That said, I, I'm sure I can trust you to comport yourself in a responsible manner. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Good. Carolily looks uh, over at Violet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone looks over at Violet. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of tut tutting from Ms. Feather. Just the, oh dear, oh dear. It's oh, fine, okay. And she actually turns back to the other two partners, like, "Gentlemen, are you absolutely sure about this?" It's like, I, in some cases, one must cut the apron strings. Hmm? Apron strings, indeed. Very well, Violette. I. <clears throat> I must say, that was quite impressive, what you did to that um, straw man. You demolished the straw man argument, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. And I am... <laughs> I am... Uh, no. I am loath to admit when I am wrong, but clearly you have not been ignoring certain aspects of your education. Thanks. <laughs> Hmm. Yes. Well, and she just gives you like a handshake, <laughs> which is quite a breakthrough. Oh. Violet's going to be riding high on this all day. <laughs> now then, uh, Mr. Horn or Mr. Feather should be able to brief you further. I must uh, make other arrangements. Uh, Gigvich, do you have those files? Ah, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, nice work, everybody. You're going you're gonna to knock them dead. Perhaps even literally, who can oh. say, as uh, they, the two of them leave. Mr. Horn and Mr. Whisker uh, now turn to you. Hmm. You all did very well. I see that my faith in you is not misplaced. And indeed, it was I who first proposed this to the other partners. I know you will not make me regret that choice. Wait, did he said like act like knock him dead, like actually knock him dead? Like this isn't going to be that dangerous, right? Hmm. Well, as we mentioned, not everyone holds the law in such esteem as we do, and we wish to make sure that if the need arose, you are all capable of defending yourselves. I think they have acquitted themselves remarkably well. This demonstration was not necessary as far as I am concerned, but the others were slightly more hesitant. In any case, perhaps we should tell you what it is we need from you. A goblin by the name of Scudge. Uh, that is S-K-U-D. J, if you're wondering, Hortense. I assume Hortense has already got yes, a notebook out. No, notebook out. Yeah, so he's sort of like board. leaning over the notebook like, yes, S-K-U-D-J, yes. He is our client in question. This dossier will contain his whereabouts and the particulars of his case. Young ones, if there is anything else you need, let Gigvit know. Uh, at this, Cornet will pull out a, a piece of parchment and on it, almost like a grocery list, he has like four health potions, a set of bandages, <laughs> um, like two torches. <laughs> and Viola, so he's got like, over his shoulder, over his shoulder is like, uh, I need about at least like two, three, maybe four pounds of peanuts and maybe um, some sunflower seeds. And maybe, like, do you know those little mealworms? Those little grub mealworms? Yeah, get some of those on there, too. Six health potions. 
<laughs> and as this uh, shopping list uh, or wish list mm -hmm. is composed, uh, we'll pull back from the courtyard. We see it over top. We still see the smoking and smoldering straw mannequins. We see some lying in pieces on the ground. And we see the various members of this new team crowding in uh, and uh, sort of sticking up their, their hands and making various requests. As we bring this, the inaugural episode of The Claw Firm, to a close. Thank you very much for watching us here on Demiplate.